Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. It's 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. I see already that there are uh, participants from all over the world, including uh, Lebanon, Norway, and Australia. So welcome to all of you. I'm not sure where uh, in the world you might be listening, but we're happy to have you participating in today's Ask the Expert webinar. We are very, very pleased to host a world-renowned panel of periodontists uh, showing some of their work and answering questions. A little bit of housekeeping about this. Uh, our intention to protect the integrity of the decks of our various speakers, beginning uh, with Dr. Chang, is that uh, we have you on mute. There are several hundred of you participating. So to have open mics for everyone would uh, be very difficult to sort of filter out the questions and answer those. Uh, at the bottom, if you move your cursor to the bottom in your menu, there is a raise hand function. Uh, so there's one of two ways that you can get a question to me. I believe that raise the hand might be the best way to do it. It does put it in chronological order of when the question was asked. Uh, and when, for example, our first presenter, Dr. Chang, is done with his deck uh, and his entertaining questions, we'll be able to go uh, click on you and you'll be able to ask your question of Dr. Chang uh, person to person. So that might be the best way to do it, to protect the integrity of the discussion. Uh, and I'll ask you to be patient as you raise your hand. We'll get to just as many, if not all, all of you as we can or that time allows. At the end of the presentation, so at five o'clock Pacific, I'll go through the steps to receive your one CE credit for this. Again, it is uh, approved via AGD PACE and we're happy to administer that. So if you just have some patience at the end, it'll take a few minutes for me to explain to you how to get that credit. And once again, we're very happy that you joined. It's my pleasure now to introduce our host for this evening and a moderator of the panel, Dr. Samuel Lau. Well, thank you, David. And um, uh, for the next uh, hour, we've been able to bring together uh, four uh, stellar periodontists. Uh, this is somewhat of an offshoot of our previous webinar in which we were uh, having a conversation about managing peri uh, especially. Uh, this one will probably be more about peri So uh, our first uh, uh, Presenter will be uh, Dr. Paul Chang. Uh, Paul is, um, he attended uh, University of Maryland for his dental school, uh, went to uh, University of Texas, San Antonio. Uh, he is a diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology. Uh, he's in several organizations. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor uh, at uh, San Antonio and he's written several articles uh, and uh, he and I will be collaborating quite a bit here in the next uh, uh, year on certain things uh, relative to infantitis. Uh, he's got some great cases. So Paul, uh, why don't you first uh, share uh, your case with the group and we'll go from there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lau. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. Let's get started as we have a lot to talk about. So in order to keep a dental implant healthy long-term, a comprehensive maintenance protocol needs to be followed. This is the protocol that we ask our dental team to follow. Briefly, every implant prosthesis will be checked for movement and gingival inflammation during a routine hygiene visit. Screw loosening is the most common implant complication for posterior implants. If not taken care of right away, it can cause irreparable damage to the implant itself. Here, you can see I am palpit palpitating the gingival area to check for signs of inflammation and extradate. extradate. If there is, then I will go ahead and probe the area. As you can see first, probe reaches the implant platform, then click. It drops beyond the platform, goes into the bony defect. So this is an example of an implant that needs more advanced therapy. So if there's no gingival inflammation, BOP, or suppuration, then a super gingival maintenance is sufficient. My recommendation is a powered instrument with plastic insert at low setting to remove plaque and flush out the debris without scratching the implant prosthesis surface, if possible. As Dr. Lau mentioned earlier, we now have much better tools to clean around implant prosthesis. It is called airflow. 
which uses water and a erythritol powder to remove plaque buildup. Think of it as a miniaturized pressure washer that you use to clean your patio with. He also mentioned that sometimes it is impossible to clean properly without removing the prosthesis. Here is a prime example. Look at the intaglio surface. No matter what tools you use, you cannot clean 100% without removing it first. Here, with the removed, both implant prosthesis and abutment can be cleaned effectively. The left picture is taken after cleaning was performed using airflow, but without removing the prosthesis. The right picture is taken after cleaning was performed again using airflow and an erbium laser. Can you guys see the difference? So let's go over a case scenario. Patient had tooth number nine replaced with a dental implant in 2013. She showed up in 2019. Clinically, there's no mobility. However, you see the gingival tissue looks inflamed. Upon palpation, there was extrudate noted and a six plus probing depth on the facial. Look at the periapical radiograph. Angular bone loss is also observed. So in this case, a basic supergingival implant maintenance would not be sufficient. So we will follow the flow chart. The next step is to evaluate the soft tissue. As you can see, there is no carinized tissue. So we have BOP, suppuration, and no carinized tissue. This case should be referred for surgical implant repair. So step one. Prosthesis is removed. Step two, flap is reflect, reflected to visualize the defect. Not surprisingly, you can see there is a lot of granulation tissue present. Step three, granulation tissue is removed. Traditionally, we use titanium brushes, Cavitron, and curettes. However, laser, specifically an air erbium laser, is the most effective method of removing granulation tissue without damaging the implant itself. The tip of the uh, laser is about the same diameter as a probe. Because of this, you can get into small defect areas where no other instruments can get, get to. Step four, here I'm using the side firing tip to decontaminate the implant surface. Multiple studies have shown that laser can decontaminate implant surface without overheating or change the implant surfaces, surface uh, characteristics. Step five, decortication. We always decorticate bone when we perform lateral ridge augmentation, right? The same concept applies here. Decortication allow progenitor cells easy access to the bone graft sites to facilitate osteoregeneration. It also enhances the physical connection between a bone graft and the recipient site. Do you guys see the perfectly round holes? There are no other instruments can do that more precisely. Step six, biomodification, such as MDGAIN, PDGF, or PRF are applied to promote regeneration. Bone graft is placed. A non-cross-linked membrane is placed. A piece of connected tissue harvested from the palate is placed on top. Lastly, a tension-free flap closure. Here is one month post-op healing. Here is three month post-op healing. Again, initial. Here is the three months post-op. Dental implant is the standard of the care for tooth replacement. As we place more of them and have more of them in long-term function, we need a predictable, comprehensive implant maintenance and treatment protocol. With the introduction of new tools such as airflow, erbium laser, and growth factors such as PRF, MDGAIN, and PDGF, I believe we're almost there. With that, I want to thank Dr. Lau for allowing me to share this case with you guys. 
And uh, I guess we're open for questions. Yes, we are, Dr. Chang. I just want to make sure I was off mute. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to go to a couple of questions. Uh, they're just starting to come in now. The first one is from uh, Emily Skibinski. Excuse me if I didn't say that correctly. Uh, if you can't see the question, and uh, I'll repeat it, what was the name of the pressure washer device that you mentioned? It's called Airflow, Airflow. Uh, made by Dan Supply. Okay. Uh, and what is the powder that's used with the Airflow? It's the erythritol powder. Maybe Dr. Lau, you can chime in on the reason why we, you're using erythritol versus some of the other uh, powders. Sure. Um, one of the uh, areas that we would caution is using your classic um, air type device uh, that is called, you know, that uses sodium bicarb, which is 60 microns and sharp. Uh, there are some studies demonstrating that it can actually have an adverse effect on an implant. So uh, Paul is right on target uh, using uh, devices either from Cavo, Hubridi, EMS. Uh, but the trick here is, is the powder, either the erythritol powder uh, that is there or the glycine powders are really becoming a major, major um, component with not just surgical, but also maintenance. And you can see what was able to occur with him using uh, the EMS uh, airflow from Euphredi relative to, uh, especially under the, the overditcher. Excellent. Uh, are, is there or are there any randomized clinical trials on this protocol specifically for the laser, Dr. Chang? Um, Dr. Lau? Uh, yes, uh, there is at least uh, two uh, studies that have been done uh, using this particular protocol and uh, uh, one uh, clinical, one radiographic. Um, but moreover, we have an excellent randomized control trial being going on right now with uh, Columbia uh, University and uh, with uh, Dr. Kang. And also we have a histology study just about ready to get published uh, with uh, Dr. Ron Nevins and David Kim uh, in as far as looking at histology, especially in the area of also adding uh, biologics and osteosgrafting. Excellent. We've got uh, time for maybe just a question or two more before we switch to our next presenter. Uh, Ed Cusack wants to know, was that allograft or xenograft in your case, Dr. Chang? Uh, it's allograft. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Mast would like to know what the membrane was. Um, there are different membranes. In, the, in this case, I used a BioGuide membrane. Uh, I am starting to try out some of the other membranes, such as the uh, BioExclude, which seems to have a, a better handling. Okay, excellent. Uh, I'll ask one more from the Q&A panel, then I think there might be a live question or two, uh, Dr. Chang as well. Uh, Nathan, my colleague, will handle that. But the last one from the Q&A panel then, um, at what point would you recommend or consider explantation due to a severe bony defect? Um, that is a, a difficult question to answer in the time given, but there's a lot of protocols. It depends on how much bone loss you have had experienced, depends on the defect, is it contained, non-contained, depends on the soft tissue. So there are a lot of uh, classifications I would recommend you review before on deciding that. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Nathan is co-producing and I'll uh, turn it over to him for uh, potentially a live question. Is that correct, Nathan? Yes, that's correct. We have Dr. Michael Engel. All today. Hello, doctor. Good. Um, my question to you is, how many times with your laser do you go around each implant and do you irrigate it out with chlorhexidine to make sure you get all the particulates out of there? So uh, I, will, I use the side firing tip um, because we're using a erbium laser. So it will actually, 
think of it as a uh, a powered piezo per se because it will uh, irrigate the area with distilled water. You know, you're using the laser, uh, the photoacoustic effect of right. the laser on the water to remove the bacteria or the contaminant on the implant. So yeah, I, it, is a, it is a slow process, so it takes a while, for sure. Okay, okay. would you not That's, use the uh, RFT tips? You can. The RFT is, Dr. Lau also recommend that as well. I find that it'd be easier to use the side fire because it directs at the right angle. So you can actually clean the top of the thread and also underneath this thread. So there are a lot of different areas that you need to clean. So if you, I can access directly, sometimes I even use an end firing tip. So okay. my goal is to remove the, uh, to remove as much contaminant as I can. The still... second question to re respond to your second question, as far as chlorhexidine, I do not use chlorhexidine or tetracycline or any kind of chemical treatment on my implant surface anymore. Because what I've seen is a lot of slower healing due to the cytotoxic effect of these uh, ingredients. Okay. Would you use uh, Would you use a, a RFT on a natural tooth? A radio firing tip on yes. a natural tooth to do yeah to debride it. Yeah. To debride it, yes, I I would do that, and also I'll use a N firing tip to decorticate the defect around the natural tooth as well. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Engel, for the question and Dr. Chang for the very informative uh, case. Uh, we are going to switch over to Dr. Clem now, who's going to show uh, one of his cases. So Dr. Clem, if you'd like to share your screen, we can bring up uh, your presentation and go through the same exercise. Again, thank you, Dr. Chang. I know that there are a fair number of questions that we weren't able to get to, so we'll hold those in a queue until the end of our hour together and see if we can't address a few more of those. Does that sound acceptable, Dr. Chang? Sure, absolutely. Excellent, thank you. So I think we need to shut this uh, screen down. And while we do that, uh, I will just remind you that you do have the opportunity to press the raise your hand button as Dr. Engel did. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question verbally, I will try and share uh, the, the questions both from the Q&A panel as well as uh, as time permits and verbal questions too. So is my screen up now? Not quite yet, Dr. Clinton. Mm, I'm seeing it. So let's see what's going on. While you're going through that, Dr. Clem, Dr. Chang, maybe I'll just ask you one more question from the Q&A panel and we'll, we'll fill in the time. Is that okay? Sure. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, in a closed procedure, and it looks like his is coming up. Uh, I'll finish it since we started it. In a closed procedure, how many times do you go around the implant or tooth? Do you irrigate with chlorhexidine? Um, you know, I'll defer that to Dr. Lau um, as far as the closed uh, approach. Yeah, we, uh, the closed approach, um, and it's, this is somewhat arbitrary, but uh, we feel that uh, if you can't get the, uh, the crown off, uh, and especially if it's convex, and you've got more than 25% uh, resorption around the threads, uh, you really need to be reflecting a flap. Uh, the only time that we will do like a mini flap is less than 25%. We can take the crown off so that we can get the tips uh, parallel uh, to the long axis of the implant. Thank you very much, Dr. Lau. And would you mind introducing our next presenter? Sure. It's uh, my pleasure also to uh, introduce another friend uh, Don Clem. Uh, Don is uh, not only a diplomate of the American Board, he's uh, the current chair of the American Board of Periodontology. Uh, he and I were together as officers in the American Academy of Perio, so he is a past president. Uh, he has been the recipient of the Earl Robinson Award, uh, which is the highest award we give for research. Uh, he just published a great article in the uh, uh, um, clinical restorative dentistry, uh, uh, and it's on uh, using erbiums. Uh, so I highly recommend that you take a look at that. 
and uh, he's the uh, uh, principal investigator of the very first uh, truly randomized control trial uh, of doing perio repair uh, versus mist, and that will is accepted for publication and will be out very soon. So Don, uh, very uh, uh, happy to have you and for you to present your case. Uh, thanks, Sam. So uh, thanks for Dr. Uh, Chang as well for kind of laying the groundwork here in terms of uh, how we treat some of these periimplantitis lesions. And one of the things that we want to really kind of look at is really what is our definition of periimplantitis? And there's been a lot of definitions and a lot of a lot of uh, opinions. But finally, we actually have a recognized definition of a periimplantitis lesion. And basically, uh, 2017 World Workshop defined the periimplantitis lesion in the absence of historical radiographic data as a probing depth greater or equal to six millimeters with greater or equal to three millimeters of bone loss and bleeding on probing. So in the absence of radiographic data, in terms of historical data, if you have those three uh, conditions, greater or equal to six millimeter probing depth, greater or equal to three millimeters of bone loss and bleeding on probing, you can assume that this is a, a lesion of periimplantitis. And one of the things that we look at, at in terms of these lesions is how they respond uh, both to uh, surface decontamination and surface preparation of the implant and uh, in terms of etiology of why this has occurred. But regardless of etiology, we basically have three things that we're dealing with. We're dealing with a contaminated implant surface. We're dealing with a chronically inflamed and infected granulomatous tissue. And we're dealing with very deep, torturous vertical defects frequently. So how do we manage all of those? So while we've managed those in a number of different ways, we've chosen to concentrate on erbium and wavelength in terms of laser preparation. And why have we done that? Well, we've done that for a couple of different reasons. Number one, uh, that wavelength is actually one of the only light wavelengths that has been shown by Yamamoto and his group in terms of what that laser actually does to the implant surface, how it changes the implant surface, and if it impedes bone regeneration around the implant surface, either an implant that is non-contaminated or an implant that has been contaminated. So between Yamamoto's work in terms of what the effects of erbium wavelength is on a non-contaminated implant surface and how it can integrate in bone, and Nevin's work in terms of how a, implant, a contaminated implant surface is changed and its compatibility with bone, we feel very confident that the erbium wavelength will indeed allow this implant to be decontaminated and not impede bone formation. And if you look at this case, you see uh, the pre-op lesions around this implant that I placed approximately five years previously, and this individual was approximately 83 years old, and he did not want to lose his implant. So as Sam had mentioned, all of these cases we do with full flap thickness. And what you see on the slide on the right is the implant surface that has been modified by application of the erbium wavelength. One of the questions I heard with Dr. Chang's presentation was, how, do you, how many times do you pass the, the laser around the implant, or how do you know when the implant surface has been treated by laser wavelength? That's a very difficult question to answer at this point. And at this time, we really have no objective means of determining that. But this is a case from our study that we published uh, in uh, July 2019 in the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry. And if you look closely at the slide on the right, you will see that the appearance of the implant surface after laser has been applied has been modified in appearance with discoloration. Uh, however, we know from Yamamoto's work that these uh, changes in surface of these implant surfaces 
does not impede with bone regeneration. The other thing that you'll notice in this slide is the complete lack of granulomatous tissue. When you start to treat these lesions on a regular basis, you'll soon find that removal of this granulomatous tissue is very difficult with a, any type of hand instrument or any type of curette. Once we have that removed, now we have uh, a significant uh, vertical defect with which to manage. In this case, we've chosen to manage this with application of enamel matrix derivatives and demineralized freeze-dried bone allograft. And we'll, we can go into that a little bit maybe in the question and answer portion. And this is now our um, result approximately 24 months. Oops, let's see if I can go back. Uh, 24 months uh, post-grafting. I think our, our uh, let's see, there you go. So at 24 months post-grafting with demineralized freeze-dried bone allograft in combination of uh, enamel matrix derivatives, this is the radiographic result that we have gotten. And this is from our study. This is uh, uh, a one-year follow-up. This patient is at two years, and we're soon getting ready to look at our three- to five-year follow-up on these cases. So if we go to the next case then, and I, I will say this, I will say on this previous case, we did not use any membranes. So one of the things that we were trying to accomplish with this uh, controlled case series that we embarked on is we tried to simplify the protocol as much as possible. Some of the protocols that we're seeing are so complex and require so many materials, it's difficult to determine what the essential component of any of those protocols actually is. Now, we haven't been able to determine that from our case series, but we started out to try and minimize the, the amount of materials that we uh, employ in managing these lesions. So many of the lesions that we followed, and there are 84 of them, 84 consecutive lesions that we followed in this uh, published case series, um, we tried to minimize the use of membranes, minimize the use of materials. So in the next case, again, from, from this case series, you're going to see that I just broke my own rule. And we have to use some common clinical judgment here. So this individual was referred to us uh, for uh, removal of these two implants, grafting and replacing these two implants. Well, this, this lady had these implants in for 12 years, and she wasn't going to give them up um, willingly. So after speaking with her, we decided to go ahead and treat her in a regenerative approach. Now you see that there's a significant amount of facial loss of bone around these implants. These implants are post-laser treated. You can see some discoloration on the implant itself, removal of the granulation tissue. And now once we graft this, we're going to need to contain the graft somehow. If these lesions are not self-containing, like the previous case that you saw, then we did indeed use a uh, membrane. Uh, in this case, it was a bioguide membrane, which only lasts probably six to eight to 10 weeks, or probably actually six to eight weeks probably, only to contain the graft. And this is where we're at now in terms of probing depth, approximately 12 months following treatment. And here she is, uh, November of uh, 2016, with vertical treatments uh, pre-grafting. Uh, pre this is now uh, April 2017, and now this is October of 2019. And as you follow these cases, if the regeneration occurs, it will take at least a year to two years before you can see the maximum regeneration that you will get. Uh, many times we'll see six-month results uh, in, some, in some case series or six months results in some case reports. And, and when we're dealing with any type of regenerative approach, either around natural teeth or around implants and a peri-implantitis type lesion, it's going to take at least 12 to 24 months before you can see the maximal effect of any regenerative approach that you, uh, that you will have. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we chose uh, a different material. These cases that you've seen previously 
we're all done with the mineralized freeze-dried bone allograft. Well, in our quest to sort of minimize materials that we use, we thought about how can we support the flap. Once you flap these cases, um, and if you are not supporting the flap, either with the materials that you use or some type of barrier membrane, the flap will indeed collapse into those larger defects. So in this particular case, we used a combination of 70% um, demineralized freeze-dry bone allograft with 30% mineralized freeze-dry bone allograft. Why did we do that? Well, we know from the orthopedic literature that mineralized freeze-dry bone allograft has a much higher compressive strength than demineralized freeze-dry bone. And as a result, we wanted to see if we can get better flap adaptation and support with a material that's more resistant to flap closure and pressure. We also know that there's uh, increasing data out there that looks at platelet-derived growth factor and its ability to enhance the turnover of mineralized products. One of the things that we're concerned about with mineralized products either with a xenograft or an allograft, is we want to be, uh, have some assurance clinically that when we see radiopacity in a uh, previously grafted site, that that radiopacity is really new patient bone and not residual graft particles that are highly mineralized and uh, are, hot, uh, are dense and radiopaque. That's one of the concerns I have, quite frankly, about using xenografts. Xenografts is called a radiographic success. You have bone fill and a radiograph immediately upon placement of the xenograph because it's very radio-opaque. And while it looks impressive, the clinician has difficulty determining if it's really patient bone that we're looking at or, again, if it's residual graft particles. So if you follow this case out, and we follow this case out for three years, we can see uh, the slide on the left that we have a 10 millimeter defect with a large vertical defect. We can see at two months, we can see some haziness and some radiopacity, which really relates to some residual um, mineralized freeze-dried bone allograft, but it looks very loose and very um, low density. And that's because most of this lesion is filled with the mineralized freeze-dried bone allograft. But as you follow it out from two months to six months to 18 months to now 36 months, you see increasing density of bone. And you can track the increased density of bone based on the turnover of both the mineralized freeze-dried bone allograft and the mineralized but you're, at least the clinician is more confident that we, when we see increasing densities like this, that we're uh, more confident that it is indeed uh, new bone that is forming and not the persistence of residual graft particles. Um, in this uh, particular case, we were able to have a, a five millimeter decrease in probing depth, uh, which is maintainable now um, and bone fill of over 50% uh, on this defect, which we, are, which we saw consistently um, with our, our uh, case series that was, that was published. So um, with that, we can maybe move to some question and answers, and we can right. delve a little more uh, in detail. Thank you very much, Dr. Clem. Uh, very engaging uh, presentation and, and excellent results. Uh, we're going to divide and conquer on the questions. If that's okay with you, I'll ask you a couple uh, to get started from the Q&A panel, and then Nathan is going to help us uh, allow some of the attendees to ask a question or two live as well. Uh, so the first question to you is actually in two parts. Dr. Clem, it comes from Dr. Leo Lander. What is the purpose of using m gain would be the first part. So, you know, we have an increasing array of biologics that have come online, and, and really the first biologic used to enhance regeneration, either in medicine or dentistry, was enamel matrix derivatives. And enamel, enamel matrix derivatives is really a combination of different types of proteins, one of which is amelogenins, 
which has been very instrumental in terms of uh, bone regeneration. And there is actually uh, a randomly controlled clinical trial by Renvert uh, about a year ago, and they looked specifically at periimplantitis lesions in which they debrided, and the only thing that they used was enamel matrix derivatives as opposed to um, uh, uh, debridement as a monotherapy. And what they uh, found was that there was a significant gain in bone strictly with the use of enamel matrix derivatives. So from our uh, standpoint, um, the use of enamel matrix derivatives, while it's difficult to uh, comment on the, the critical nature of this step, uh, we have used it when using uh, demineralized freeze-dried bone allografts around teeth. Now with the data from Renvert, we've adapted that to implants. And I, I will say that the difficulty with any of these long-term case series is that we're unable to identify the critical step at this point. Excellent. Thank you for that, Doctor. Uh, one more from the Q&A panel. Uh, well, this one seems to be pretty quick, uh, so maybe we'll take two, but are you concerned with the open margin on the distal of number 29? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I'll tell you what. Depending on the angle of the radiograph, uh, and these are, if you look at these are uh, older tissue level uh, uh, Strauman implants where we cemented everything, um, I can't. I can't tell you when these were placed, but it's it's some time ago because we haven't placed tissue levels in quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you will find open margins more than not on these implants. Uh, very difficult, and of course, I'm concerned with it. At this point, the patient's maintaining well. He's had a good result for three years, and he's followed in my maintenance practice. So, these patients, uh, unfortunately, you know, when when they when they break a crown on a natural tooth, they'll come to you and they'll say, "I broke my crown." When they have a problem with the crown on the implant, they'll say, uh, your crown on the implant broke, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Clem, and out of uh, respect to our other panelists, uh, I believe Dr. Papp would be next with his case. Uh, we are uh, cataloging all of the questions. If we do have time, we can get back to them, uh, but there will be some follow-up and an opportunity for us to uh, get to these uh, questions uh, as, as time allows. Uh, Dr. Papp, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen and uh, getting ready to go. Perfect. Sam, would you mind doing the introduction for us? Uh, again, uh, another good friend, uh, Jim Papp. Uh, Jim um, got his uh, dental degree at the University of Kentucky, uh, but then got his certificate in perio from uh, University of Michigan, uh, which is just one of the outstanding perio programs in the country. Uh, he now practices at uh, Great Lakes Periodontics, uh, laser surgery and dental implants, and his hometown of Grand Rapids. Uh, he's been using lasers for a, a good seven years. Uh, he uses uh, several of the Erbium Chromium OSGG lasers, and uh, he actually it has a fellowship in the uh, WCLI. So Jim, we're very happy to have you. Well, thank you, Sam. I appreciate that, and thank you for our, to our panel for all your contributions. And what I'd like to do is go through a classic case presentation in, in my private practice uh, that's a peri-implant titus case. And I know we have I'll try to keep it in five minutes around that time, but I'll move along as quickly as I can there. Um, but this particular patient was referred to our office, um, as it was said on the referral for implant bone loss on uh, number 30. Um, Patient's a 63-year-old female with an unremarkable medical history. And implant 30 was placed by her general dentist approximately six years ago. And this, this case occurred about three years ago. Um, the patient's been on a six-month recall interval with her general dentist. Uh, reports discomfort when pressing on the buccal surface of the implant, number 30, and an occasional uh, bad taste and she's currently not wearing a, a bite splint. Um, radiographic exam, significant, as you can see, significant vertical bone loss on implant number 30, vertical bone loss, mesial 31. And the bone defect, you know, it's in, 
because I, from the surgical access, uh, the defect extends from the mesial lingual of implant 30, circumferentially around the buccal, and actually extends. It doesn't look like there's much of a defect there, but once you get in there surgically, it's always much worse than what the x-ray looks like. And this particular defect extended to the distal of, of the implant. Uh, 31, fairly large retention post, otherwise really unremarkable around the remaining dentition. Clinical exam, uh, exudate was noted on, on pressure with the implant on the buccal. Thin biotype was noted, or we call it phenotype now. Um, Clusal wear patterns were noted throughout. Um, probing depths for implant number 30, uh, 10 millimeters along the mesial, 12 plus millimeters, and I say 12 plus because I, I pretty much stopped at 12. It's it's deep, <laughs> and it goes beyond there. Uh, the distal uh, was measuring 7 millimeters as well as the mesial of 31. Um, bleeding on probing is noted throughout. Adequate keratinized tissue. Otherwise, 3 or 4 millimeter probing depths throughout the dentition there. And uh, the good news is the implant is not mobile, so that gives us some hope. And the diagnosis uh, that I came up with is localized stage 3 grade B periodontitis, uh, which back three years ago we called it chronic periodontitis. Um, Periimplantitis number 30, bruxism and clinching, potential root fracture on the, the mesial 31, not quite sure, and I'll take a look at that surgically when I get in there and a thin biotype or phenotype on the buccal of 31. I give these, uh, this area, implant 30 and the tooth number 31, questionable prognosis. For number 31, I'm not quite sure if there is a fracture, and obviously that's gonna change things and the prognosis quite a bit. So at the, the initial exam, obviously I deem that questionable. Implant 30 I deem questionable simply because oftentimes there are at times, these can uh, respond somewhat unpredictably uh, to therapy. And as far as we don't know how um, uh, diligent they're going to be with their home care and how compliant they're going to be with their maintenance. Um, and so how we approached this case was um, bite splint therapy first and foremost. Um, I'll put my patients in, in bite splints that are obviously our Brooksers, especially before treatment. Um, in efforts to control any contributing factors that um, uh, that I can give us a chance. And also, Brooksers and clinchers, they tend to um, have a much better post-operative course if they're already in a bite splint. They tend to guard or clinch more and grind more once they've had uh, surgical therapy or and other types of therapy as well. Um, prescribed systemic augmentin, 875 for seven days and start three days prior. Um, there's some other things you could use augmenting there as well. Laser assisted pocket reduction 30 and 31 with bone graft and placement of an alloderm regenerative tissue matrix on the buckle of 31, uh, implant 30. And of course, a three month alternating recall interval between our office and the general dentist. And um, the step one, or how I approach this surgically, um, I, I always start with uh, the uh, de epithelialization uh, of the inner and outer um, um, pocket lining, I would say. And, uh, and I do this for a couple of reasons. One is that, you know, I want to try to slow or impede, at least theoretically impede or slow epithelial migration. In back into our defect to give us a better chance of regeneration you know, along the uh, alveolar bone defects. But it also, you know, this early on in the first step, it gives me uh, the opportunity to evaluate just how the laser is interacting with the tissue. And then I can make adjustments from there on out, and it saves a lot of time and as far as my future settings with the uh, utilizing the laser. Next, um, <clears throat> what I do is uh, what I would call scalloping uh, or a gingivectomy around natural tooth number 31 as well as the implant. Pretty standard scalloping or gingivectomy around 31. Um, around the implants, uh, have to be a little bit more careful because uh, I want to 
scallop the tissue to benefit pocket reduction, but I don't want to scallop the tissue too much to where it exposes the implant or minimizes the keratinized tissue. And you can get an idea for where the implant is positioned uh, versus the adjacent teeth and bone levels that I've, I've got quite a bit of playroom here as far as the amount of soft tissue that I was able to um, remove there, which I was happy about. And there was sufficient amount of keratinized tissue is there as well, and it colored it well. Following the scalloping, um, I switched the, uh, uh, to an MZ5 tip, which is pretty much a linear firing or a unidirectional firing tip. Um, and performed uh, an incision, uh, sulcular incision around implant 30 and 31, and I extended it mesial um, to include the premolars just to gain access and visibility to the, the surgical sites that I'm paying attention to. Once I elevated the flap, I uh, degranulated the, the bone defects uh, with surgical instruments. And one nice thing that I like about the I, uh, I plus or the water lays is that I could really finalize and refine my degranulation um, utilizing a radio firing tip. Uh, these tips are real long, really skinny, and they can get into some areas in particular at the base of these uh, bony defects. And from the radiograph, this bony defect on the facial extends even deeper than that. And so it's nice to utilize that for finalizing and cleaning things up. Once we de degranulate the uh, defect, <clears throat> I would prepare the natural two surface with uh, ultrasonics and hand instruments, pretty classic. Um, plastic and titanium instruments uh, with the implant. Then I would take the laser and complete or finalize my preparations on the implant surface as well as the natural two surface and I did not see or did not note any root fracture in here which is a nice sign. Maybe an internal, I may suspect that, but for now that's a good sign that I didn't see that. And <clears throat> um, once I prepared the uh, implant surface, I would irrigate with saline, uh, tetracycline slurry. I, and this was three years ago, I'm, I'm moving away from this and as well as the chlor uh, chlorhexidine irrigation. Basically, the laser is a nice replacement for these two things, I think. And I primarily use now the uh, preparation with the laser and saline irrigation. Time for the bone graft. In this particular case, I use platelet-rich plasma, which we took a blood sample um, from them uh, before the surgical appointment started. And um, <clears throat> one of the benefits uh, of the platelet-rich plasma, especially with such a large defect, the graft handling properties are, are phenomenal. You can pick up once mixed in with the bone graft, which I used here, a 70-30 mixture. Um, you can easily pick up the bone graft, mold it to your defects. Um, aids, I think, in clot stability and theoretically um, acts as a resource for growth factors because it is a, a, a platelet concentrate. Uh, finally, placed anilloderm regenerative tissue matrix acting as somewhat as a barrier um, to the bone graft, but also as a regenerative material to thicken the tissue as there was a, the tissue was very thin. Flat closure was with resorbable sutures. Post-operative, this is the six-month post-op. We have looked like some decent fill in our defects there with uh, around the implant and as well as the mesial, the natural tooth, 31. Promy depths for the implant, four to five millimeters. The, the lingual plate, it was intact on 30, which is nice. And so the promy depths along there were the fours. Fives were mainly on the buckle. Uh, three to four millimeter pockets uh, along number 31. And the biotype was as much thicker than prior to, which is nice. Uh, currently, the patient maintains an alternating three-month recall. Um, she's maintained the gains that, uh, from our surgical procedure, which is nice, and that's been stable for three years. Uh, her home care continues with daily Sonicare through toothbrush, sauna, sulca brushes, uh, proxy brushes, flossing and antimicrobial rinses, and thank goodness she wears her bite splints.
regularly. And that is all I have for you. That's great, Dr. Pat. Thank you so much. Uh, while we get ready for our next presenter, I want to remind the audience that you do have two options to get us some questions. I do have a few on the Q&A panel. There's also, if you scroll down to the bottom where the menu is, a raise hand feature. And if you raise your hand, we would be able to uh, get to you live uh, and you can ask the question to Dr. Pat yourself. So, well, perhaps we wait for some of those uh, to indicate they'd like to ask a question themselves, Dr. Pat. Uh, again, thank you for the presentation, and I'll ask you a couple that are in the panel here. Uh, what uh, does autogenous graft get better results than allograft in repairing implants? Um, you know, I would I would have to pass that on to Dr. Lau. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to both, but I'm going to defer that to Dr. Lau. As uh, I'm when you when you look at systematic studies, um, and again you heard uh, Don Clem speak, uh, we basically there's not enough long-term studies to really understand which one would be better. Um, again, going more towards this uh, demineralized freeze-dried bone, as far as actually seeing some type of uh, osseous regeneration in those areas, probably is preferred at this point. Another benefit, though, too, is, you know, getting that amount out of autogenous bone, you know, a second surgical site really, you know, uh, that's pays to the benefit of using an allograft. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it sounds good, uh, but uh, it's not easy to really find those sites. And that's why you see it's just easier getting something off the shelf than it is trying to find other uh, remaining sites and creating some more uh, from a standpoint of not necessarily injury, but just access. I agree, and then, you know, it tends to, using the allograft tends to maintain the space much better. It seems like the allograft, or autogenous graft, seems to sh uh, shrink, uh, remodel itself significantly over time. Well, thank you very much uh, to both of you for that question. Out of respect to our final presenter, Dr. Nuren, I'd like to uh, introduce him, and I know that he has a case that he'd like to uh, share for us. At we may have to uh, assist him in getting that up. So I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Lau to introduce Dr. Nuren. Thank you. Plenty of doctors on our panel today. We're lucky. Uh, and perhaps we can get uh, the last 10 minutes uh, to uh, connect to Dr. Nuren, Dr. Lau. Sure. And uh, so uh, Larry, could you uh, share your screen? Might be on mute. Let me see. So on uh, mute. Unmute. There we go. And start, start by video. Down at the bottom. Yeah. All right. What do I do next? There you are. Well, we see you, but we need to see your screen. Okay, coming up, I hope. All right. We hope so, too. <laughs> Slideshow from the beginning. Is that, you have it? Dr. Nuren, this is Nathan. You're going to have to go into the Zoom controls. And at the bottom, there is a green button that says share screen. Got it. Then now what? you will have to select your PowerPoint. Say that you're going to want to share your PowerPoint. Okay, got it. There we go, I think. All right. Excellent. All right. Well done, Dr. Well, um, thank you, Larry. Um, in our remaining few minutes that we have, uh, uh, Larry is, uh, I would consider to be uh, the professor emeritus of the laser world. Uh, he, uh, for the most part, uh, has been in the business uh, a very long time. He's Associate Professor of Periodontics at University of Maryland, uh, private practice in Annapolis for 43 years. Um, has been at the very beginning as far as charter member of the Academy of Laser Dentistry uh, and has done considerable work in the whole arena of lasers, not just the erbium lasers, but going back uh, from the very beginning. So uh, Larry, if you could uh, share your case with us and we can have a conversation. Happy to thank you, Sam. Do you hear me all right? 
Sure. Thank you. Everybody there? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the privilege of presenting this case. Uh, Mrs. B is an 82-year-old healthy female. Diagnosis was periimplantitis around tooth number nine. She had seven to eight millimeter pockets all around the implant, uh, radiographic bone loss, inflammation, bleeding on probing, and no mobility. The procedure we did was the implantitis repair protocol with flap and bone graft. And uh, let's start with basic probing. I know we have some hygienists in the audience and, and some uh, GPs uh, might not be familiar with the plastic probe. I like this around the implant because it does not damage or scratch the implant. Now, when we use the uh, probe around an implant, it's a little bit different technique than around the natural tooth. You can see I'm more parallel here rather than an angle to get past the curvature of the tooth. But you have to be careful whenever you probe not to go through the attachment, either the attachment to the tooth or to the implant. Uh, now, in the technique, in the repair protocol, we use a radio firing tip. Remember, 85% of the energy goes laterally. 15% of the energy comes out of the end. We want to kill all these bugs, not only in the pocket, on the implant, and also on the lining of the uh, pocket. Uh, and now we know it uh, penetrates up to and even beyond eight tenths of a millimeter into the circular lining. So if I did not lay the flap, I would run this around in the pocket first and try and uh, eliminate all the bacteria and debris in the pocket. However, in this technique, you see we use the RFT tip. The power settings are uh, out of the protocol. One and a half watts, 30 hertz, H mode, 40% air, 50 to 60% water uh, with the I plus and it's the implant protocol that we use. Uh, now, here's the case. You can see the inflammation. And I decided to do the flap because my motto is when in doubt, flap it, which means when I probed in here, it felt a little rough. And you can see exactly why when I did flap it. I used an envelope flap to reveal the granulation tissue and the uh, cement that was retained on the uh, crown. The number one cause for pockets and bone loss around these crowns is the cement. Uh, now you have to be careful when you remove the cement because I'll show you in a little bit, you don't want to damage the implant. So you have to flick off the, the uh, debris and the uh, cement. Here's the radiograph showing the bone loss. Not terribly deep and you can see the tooth was still uh, tight, had good implant uh, remaining in bone. Uh, here's uh, the implant, the before, and here's the after. Let's talk about the bone graft that we did. Uh, let's go back one. Uh, I used GEM 21S. Uh, also, I did not use a lateral firing tip because this case was done prior to the uh, release of the lateral firing tip. So all this was done with a radio firing tip. Uh, and uh, I don't use the chlorhexidine. I don't use any other chemicals, tetracycline. The literature shows that chlorhexidine and tetracycline can actually delay fibroblast migration. And we need those fibroblasts to, uh, are the, for the precursors uh, for the osteoblasts and cementoblasts, et cetera. And you can see here on the right, we have good healing and you can barely tell the difference between a natural tooth and the tooth with the implant. I think it turned out really, really nicely. Now, when we clean around implants, we do not want to use metal implants at all. No way, no how. You can see that it damages the surface over here. And there was even an article, we'll see a little bit, where particles uh, were actually scraped off that uh, implant surface. Uh, and uh, we, we don't want to do that. Uh, but instead, I like to use plastic or carbon instruments. And then in cleaning, we use the super floss, which is very nice. Now, uh, this is out of uh, this next picture I'm going to show is out of Stu Frome's Dental Implant Complications textbook. And you can see when you use a metal implant or a metal instrument on an implant, you can actually scrape off the, the covering uh, or the surface of that implant. The other thing is too, you do not want to use ultrasonics on an implant too, because out of a recent article last year, there are actual particles of the implant that are e either embedded in the soft tissue or floating around in the tissue space. And you can see here on the right side where the, the implant is actually damaged with an ultrasonic cleaner. Uh, the reference is down here on the bottom for those who want to look it up, it's the last year journal of Perio. Uh, as far as post-op care, uh, I like the super floss. I particularly like the gum cleaners, uh, regular brushing and uh, flossing if possible. 
So that's essentially the case. I'll discuss the further details uh, as questions come up. A uh, couple of things uh, why I do not use the Peridex uh, tetracycline. Again, uh, it's because of uh, the uh, literature shows that it does delay mig uh, fibroblast migration. And the other thing is why I like to use uh, GEM21S, and I've used this very successfully around uh, failing implants and uh, failing teeth. Uh, it, it's two ingredients. GEM21S is a product called Regranix, which has been used for diabetic wound patients for more than 20 years. And then also tricalcium phosphate, which is essentially plaster of Paris. Uh, it's easy to, to manipulate, easier to work with. And as far as barrier membranes, I do not use anything except maybe collar tape, just to hold the particles in place. Collar tape or collar coat will dissolve uh, over a period of time uh, and hold the graft in very nicely. And the material uh, firms up after you place it, uh, so the, I find it does not collapse into the pocket at all. So thank you very much. I'll take any questions and comments. Yes, uh, Dr. Nuren, thank you very much. Extremely engaging and right on time. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, questions on the question answer panel, and I know we've got at least one. It looks like now two live questions, so I'll be quick. Uh, retail price aside, Dr. Nuren, do you or anyone on the panel have experience using Infuse in these types of cases? In case types, sorry. Not at all. Dr. Lau, anything to add there? Well, I, uh, I, I have not, but I was uh, waiting for uh, uh, Dr. Chang or Dr. Path or Dr. Clem in views. I have, so, uh, I have used it before, excuse me. Um, the, there's the post-operative swelling is one issue. And then the other issue is the cost. And you said the cost, if we set, set aside the cost, my biggest worry is the post-operative swelling. So really now my go-to is some of the other ones, like I mentioned, MD Gang, PDGF, PRF, which can offer similar, if not better results. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Uh, Dr. Nuren, one last question from uh, the, the Q&A panel, and then I'll turn it over to Nathan for the live question. Uh, you had said in your presentation, sir, no ultrasonic use on implants. Is that, not, is that true even with a plastic tip? Uh, I don't have any experience with the plastic tips, but I presume it should be okay, as long as you're not using metal on the implant surface at all. Excellent. This Thank is, uh, this is uh, Don Clem. I got a comment on those plastic tips. You know, we stopped using the plastic tips uh, a significant time ago because what we found was, especially if they're used in a uh, closed approach, if you're not careful, those plastic tips will get eaten up pretty quickly by threads or rough surfaces on implants. And I've actually seen some cases where um, hygienists have attempted to maintain implants subgingively with these plastic tips. And I've seen plastic um, debris on the implant itself. So we're very, very cautious, and those plastic tips are only used on abutments or super gingival. Thank you very much, Dr. Clem. I believe we have a couple of live questions. The first one from Dr. Teresa C., if I'm saying that correctly, TSE. Dr. Teresa, are you on the phone? If you've raised your hand, you'll have to allow mic access. I believe we have Dr. Mary Newport, actually. I'm actually a hygienist. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, so you're saying we should absolutely not use a Cavitron. Like, what if we just go gently around the pocket around the implant without touching it? If there's like food debris in there, is that okay? If you're that careful, go for it. But I would not use it at all in the pocket. Okay, thank you very much. So, so with the implant tip, if you're using the implant tip, which has the plastic insert, I always have my hygienist use it just like what everybody else says, super gingivally. You're cleaning around the implant, such as a hybrid. You're cleaning around the prosthesis. You really don't want to touch the implant surface itself. But if you can see the implant exposed, then it probably requires a little bit more just a regular maintenance. So, Can I add one uh, point, please? 
Hi, this is Larry Nguyen. Can I add a point? Yes, please. Uh, there's a study done by Jazem Burke in Turkey where she uh, took a contaminated implant, cleaned it with the uh, erbium YAG uh, laser, and uh, it was so clean with the laser energy itself, you could not tell the difference under an EM scope between the original non-touched, non-used implant and the one that was contaminated. So the erbium YAG is all you need if you can get the energy to where you want it to go. You know, this is uh, Don Clem now. From a hygienist perspective, probably the instrumentation that holds the best promise for you in a general maintenance type regime. You're seeing probably a patient every hour. You got eight patients going. And if, particularly if you're in a periodontist office where there's a lot of implants that you're maintaining, uh, I think the instrumentation in a closed approach subgingivally that holds the most promise is the perio flow. And you've heard that by multiple folks. I really enjoyed the video that Paul had. Uh, things are going towards uh, air delivery systems and especially using the appropriate uh, powders in them with these very low micron, uh, 15 to 20 microns. Um, we're seeing this over and over and over again, especially for dental hygienists uh, relative to maintaining implants. And if I may, can, can I share my screen so you guys can see that before and after slide, just so people can have a better visual? I believe you can now, Dr. Chang. And then we'll have time for one more question. We are actually over, and thank you for your patience. It's, it's been a very uh, good dialogue. And while we finish uh, with your example, Dr. Chang, we'll ask one final question from Rachel D'Angelo Keller. We'll get right to that as soon as you show us. Um, can you guys see, uh, can you guys see, uh, let me see here, share screen. <clears throat> now look at the, I want you to look at the, um, look at the picture on the left and look at the picture on the right. Uh, I don't know if I can zoom in a little bit for you guys, but there are a lot of scratches and these were all done with a Cavatron with a uh, perio maintenance, uh, the, the perio tip, the implant tip. Wow. So that's why we're talking about using the airflow or the perio flow, which can help eliminate the scratches. Can you see the scratches on the right side? See the this is what we call a multi-unit abutment. There are a lot of scratches, scratches that's what, that were formed from previous multiple cleanings. So these are the things we want to avoid. And um, without airflow, without touchless air delivery system, I don't know what else we can do to prevent scratches on these implant surfaces or multi-unit surfaces. Because the implant, remember, is actually below the, uh, the gum. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Mm -hmm. uh, time for one final question from Rachel D'Angelo Keller. Forgive me if uh, I don't know if you're a doctor hygienist, so I'll introduce you as Rachel, but please go ahead and ask away. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's Rachel. I'm a hygienist. Okay. Um, I, my question is, I was told to use titanium instruments. Now, you guys are talking more plastic. What are, you, what are your thoughts about the titanium instruments? So Never. this is Don Clem. And yeah. uh, I would tell you, uh, first of all, um, we, use, we use metal probes on everything. And there, there's been nothing in the literature that indicates that metal probes is inappropriate for implants. I will also tell you that we sometimes use titanium curettes but you know, you have to think about what are you really trying to accomplish with a curette around an right. implant? Uh, not much. Um, you know, your, your tactile sense is impeded. Uh, you don't know if you're feeling the roughened surface or if you're, you're feeling a thread or if you're feeling a chunk of calculus as opposed mm -hmm. to a tooth surface. One of the things that I've experienced, similar to Dr. Chang, even with titanium instrumentation, when I've gone into an implant vertical defect surgically, and I know that the referring hygienist 
has been using a titanium curette, you will still get scratches on that implant. It's not scratch proof, even if you use okay. titanium. Now, there's some, there's some data that indicates that if you use stainless steel, um, you know, the stainless steel is, is harder than the titanium. You have cross-contamination between metals, which may not be good. So really, in terms of hand instrumentation, at least in our practice, we've really limited it to plastic and carbon fiber uh, curettes um, and standard periodontal probes. Perfect. I also have one more quick question. Um, uh, what are your thoughts about water picks? You know, I, I used to not be, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. I'm sorry, I don't want to hog this. It's Don Clem again. I've always uh, been I told by to, oral surgeons not to use them on implants. I've, but periodontists I, I, are for them. Previously, I've not been a fan of, of water picks. But I have to tell you, especially with full arch restorations and complex uh, prostheses that sometimes the contours are extremely difficult. Uh, we have gone to wall and it, it has made a difference in terms of the inflammatory profile of the soft tissue. If they're standard implants and they're in a good position and there's good contour, there's really no reason to use them. We only really uh, recommend them in for elderly patients, complex type restorations where it's difficult to clean under. Great, thank this you. Is, this is Larry Nguyen, may I add a couple points? Uh, also an ortho patient is very good, but also tell the patient never use it higher than the middle setting. Sometimes right. you turn it up high and blast away. Yes. You don't, you don't want to do that. I never say go above a six, so. That sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen. Uh, and uh, again, uh, recognizing we're about 10 minutes over, there's, there's actually uh, Dr. Ingrid that's been trying to ask this question for quite some time, and we made a commitment to her that we'd get it in there, so this will be the final question of the session. Uh, again, thank you uh, to all of our panelists and attendees for going over time with us here a little bit. Dr. Ingrid has asked the panel, what is the usual cause of implant rejection? Hers happened when she did the second step surgery, but the clinical signs showed no inflammation at all. So um, I'll take a shot at this first. This is Don Clem. So <clears throat> when we talk about implant rejection or implant bone loss or what is the etiology of peri-implantitis or, peri or implant rejection, if you will, you know, I think there's a mixed bag here. There are some that talk about a foreign body reaction. There are some that talk about strictly a microbial etiology. And I think it can be either or or a combination of both. And certainly we see that in orthopedics and the orthopedic literature. We see that there are foreign body reactions around orthopedic implants and it, it can indeed occur around dental implants as as well. When we sometimes I have difficulty determining or understanding in my own mind when I look at certain cases, which came first, the bugs or the bone loss. And we ought not immediately um, assume that in order to get bone loss, you must have bacteria around implants. That may not be the case in every case. There may be some foreign body reaction that occurs that after bone loss begins, the, the bacterial shift begins. So we certainly see that around orthopedic implants. It's not without reason that we, ought not, that we uh, would, see, would see that uh, around dental implants. Paul, can I add a point? This is Larry Nerd. Please. Uh, my, I questioned way back when uh, what caused the uh, failure of the natural tooth other than trauma is let's say it was due to poor home care. So if the patient doesn't really get religion as far as their home care, what's to say that they're not going to do any better with an implant because they paid several thousand dollars for it? So you've got to watch the home care and, uh, and the residual bacteria in the mouth. It's been shown that the bacteria can reside in the mouth and then contaminate uh, a new implant. And it's worse the second time around for implants to have a higher failure rate than the first time around. I will also, just to pick up on that comment, 
is that uh, we also know that implants will have a higher failure rate when placed in active periodontitis cases. So clearly in treatment planning, it's not just about replacing the missing tooth. It's about controlling periodontitis first before implants are placed. And unfortunately, I'm seeing uh, more cases that are coming in with periimplantitis with active periodontitis lesions around that implant, which is signaling to me that the periodontitis was never really addressed properly before the implant was placed. And that's unfortunate because it's a major risk factor. I agree 100%. Excellent. Well, with that being said, and being mindful of the time, Dr. Lau, would you like to wrap up the panel piece of this and I'll give some instructions after you're done uh, to the audience about CE, et cetera? Sure. Um, you four have definitely exceeded my expectations. Um, I hope that the participants can appreciate uh, these four point of views. Uh, there was a, a significant amount that was quite consistent uh, in managing uh, implantitis. Naturally, there's some things that uh, we don't totally understand, but one thing that we do know as a fact, and that is implantitis is out there. Uh, using uh, very conservative means may not necessarily be the direction, and especially when you have walls. And I think it really opens up the door for osseous augmentation and biologics for the future of managing uh, implant disease. So uh, thank you, David, and I truly thank our, our four panelists. Excellent, thank Dr. Lau. Yes, let me reiterate that on behalf of WCLI and on behalf of our uh, co-sponsor this evening, BioLace, thank you to Drs. Uh, Nuren, Chang, Clem, Dr. Papp as well for sharing uh, their clinical excellence with us.